we will add a post to LinkedIn to notify you. Um, I haven't asked uh, Caroline at the moment, but normally she's happy to share the deck. Yep. Um, and then we, of course, we are, we are both happy to answer questions on LinkedIn or online. And I, um, I know that Caroline probably will share her email and connection details with you. Okay. So just the training for today, uh, for this month, we, th these are the webinars. We're now on data privacy. Next week is quite intense. Uh, fortunately, the Monday is a public holiday. So please, um, I think we're moving it out to the 25th, Debbie. Is that, is that correct? Uh, Debs, just to confirm the date for the big data, data science, we're then also having data culture and the user group, and we will continue with our series on productizing data. Um, so th that's, I've been sort of encouraged to do a lot more there with uh, Doug Laney and then also in Saudi where they're talking about data value realization and we have to map it to the realization framework. So that's become very important. And then the CDMP Q&A every Friday. So that, that's the webinars for this month. Um, the uh, yeah, we did move, sorry to interrupt you. We did move the big data data science to the 25th. Okay, all right. If you wouldn't mind just sending me an update. Uh, sure. Just, thanks, Debbie. Um, and that's going to be quite an interesting one on economic data. So we have one of our people, Don Steenkamp, he's just set up a data as a service, an economic data platform, and they will be collecting large amounts of economic data to share um, similar to an open data type of structure. Okay. Um, and then we, we got uh, the data, the training. We are on data for certification, data management for certification. And next month we'll be doing data architecture, how to analyze data. If there's anyone who wants to do data architecture, please, or analyzing, and this is both, remember, this is both data warehousing BI and big data. It's quite an intense course because we have to get through both of those sections at the same time. All right, and at this point in time, I will stop presenting and we'll hand over to Caroline. Caroline, thank you very much. Great, thanks very much. Um, Good. Well, hello, everybody. I'm going to just um, take over. Sorry, I'm just actually just realized that if I copy your slides into my slide deck, that might be a bit easier than I could jump around. I'm just busy doing that. Um, so my name is Caroline. I have worked in IT for more years than I care to mention. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and I've um, been working with Howard uh, for a little while now to, to have a look at um, how we can support the data management community in managing privacy. So how, how do we look at privacy and specifically copy? And we were, yeah, sort of trying to combine our, our knowledge to, to come up with sort of practical implications um, of, of, of privacy and copy compliance. So we walked a long road with this. If you haven't been to these, these talks before, We've had a look at a lot of different things like practical um, implications of, for example, you know, how do we manage data breaches? How do we um, how do we classify data? Um, you know, just looking at like if we're taking the law and then saying, all right, Howard, if the law says this now, what must we do? Now, one of the things that I think is the the more difficult things to manage is when it comes to unstructured data. I think you know when you have structured data in databases, um, and we know where everything is and it's neat and tidy. All of the good Dharma stuff applies, <laughs> um, part of, but one of the elements of the Dharma wheel is document management, um, and that starts falling into the unstructured information. So I'm going to kick off with a presentation now, if I can find the first slide. So I'm going to have to do my whole screen, so apologies for the... I'm going to have to do my entire for that. All right, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Yes, okay. We can. So um, I, I do have a background in information governance and information management, but not the Dharma side. So not the, um, the Dharma DMBOC has the document management uh, requirement um, or, or part of the wheel. 
Um, but I've looked at it from other aspects of this more in terms of enterprise content management information governance. So you'll be hearing a few sort of other ideas coming um, that maybe are, are not entirely Dharma aligned. Um, but I think it all works together and it's, it's obviously all good practice, so it works pretty well. Um, just in terms of me, when, um, whenever I speak to you about property and privacy and we're going to be talking about some property risks and, and penalties today, please note this, I am not a lawyer, I'm not giving you legal advice. All I'm giving you is letting you know there's rocks in the water and you need to go get legal advice if you need that or you need to go get cons um, consult with your compliance manager or risk manager. Um, so please don't take anything I say as being legal advice, okay? Right, so first of all, uh, document and content management. Um, essentially, this is where we're talking about the life cycle, of, like managing a, a, a data through a life cycle. You know, we create the data, we store it, uh, we share it, um, we consult, and ultimately, hopefully, we delete it, which apparently everyone is really bad at. Um, and when we look at the, the information versus data, you know, you've got data in your databases, but then obviously, as soon as I can ex um, download that into an Excel spreadsheet, it becomes a document, um, or more generically, a content. And content is a very broad term. Um, you can look up enterprise content management. Um, it's a whole discipline around that. Um, electronic document management, obviously, and records management, which started many moons ago, long before computers. You know, back in the typing pool days, probably had it in the you know when they were doing like cuneiform tablets. You know, back with the Phoenicians. We they need we need ways once once we've created a document once we've created some content we need ways to store it and find it again and that is uh, our filing systems our file plans making sure we keep things organised if you think of a doctor's room you know you'll you'll have the patient file and when you walk in they'll have it stored in a particular place where they can find it easily it'll be stored in a logical sequence probably by by um, surname um, and they'll have a unique reference number like for example a patient number. Um, to distinguish, you know, one JSOC from the other. So all of these things are very sensible and very logical, and we understand them very well. But somehow, I don't know what happened, but ever since we got like personal computers, I feel like everyone's everyone's brains kind of fell out. And we sort of said, oh, look, I can create documents and records and spreadsheets as willy-nilly. I can just type up a document anytime or extract the spreadsheet anytime. And we suddenly went mad and we just started behaving as though records management was a brand new idea. Um, so part of what Poppy and Privacy does is call us back to these original and long-standing disciplines of document management, records management, content management, and making sure that we can store, publish, reuse, find, backup, you know, and manage these things in a structured way. The trouble is they're not structured. And if any of you have ever tried to clear out a file share, or a SharePoint library that hasn't been well managed, you will know what I'm talking about, right? Um, so just a couple of terms, like information in generically would be both your structured data and your content. Within your content, one of the subsets would be documents, and one of the subsets of that would be records, which kind of overlaps. Now, if you think about, for example, if I'm busy collaborating on a document, um, and I'm going backwards and forwards and I'm saying, all right, what do you guys think? What do we think? Okay, we got, then we're going to include this, we're going to take that out. And we come to a version I'd be happy with and I create a PDF version of that and everybody signs it as a contract. That signed PDF is now a record, a record in the date and time, right? So that is now something that is evidence of something that happened at a point in time. The document has got a much more sort of fluid life cycle. It's got um, audit trails, it's got change history, it's got people have got different levels of access to it. So a document is a living thing that has a lot of version, versioning going on and a lot of access requirements and collaboration requirements and creation and content creation. Whereas records are a log, right? This is like, this, some, this is something that happened at a point in time and it is a representation and a, and a point of evidence. So for example, a contract would be a type of record. Um, and interestingly, like for example, you'll hear me talk about the medical field. Um, for example, in the medical field, one of the types of records that goes into a patient file, um, especially in the hospital, will be things like litmus tests. So if you go in for a surgery, they're going to take litmus tests of the different, you know, sort of physical little bit of strip paper. Um, and they're going to test the different pieces uh, of equipment that are in there to make sure that they are actually sanitized. Then they're going to keep that litmus test with the color that shows that it has, you know, the content, there's no contamination. They keep that piece of paper in your file as part of your 
if that event as part of that. Um, in your, you, you, you have your event is that you came to hospital and you had surgery. Now, part of your patient record is that the equipment in, in the surgery was tested and that it was had been um, sanitized correctly. So records don't are not always um, documents or PDF uh, files. They're not easy to store. Sometimes they're very difficult to store. Um, we also have records where, for example, um, you, you might have CCTV footage. Um, and as soon as you have a theft or some sort of incident, that CCTV footage becomes a record of what happened and now it needs to be preserved because now it's, some, it's evidence of what happened. Um, so I'm, I'm going to leave that there because that's as much as I want to go into. But you'll see, you notice at the bottom, the move from unstructured to structured. So unstructured, you understand very well. If any of you have ever tried to work in somebody else's outlook, where they have their, their folder directory set up of how they've organized the emails. You know, some people organize the emails by things that they've received from specific people. Some people do it by date. Some people do it by topic. Some people do it by project. We all have our very own ways of understanding how to manage data. Um, how to manage our records and how to manage our, our correspondence. So content management covers all of that. The emails, document sharing, collaboration, communication, uh, videos, record, you know, physical records, paper records, um, paper management, all of that stuff. Any, any questions about that, about information, content, documents, records? Is there, am I coming through okay, by the way? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Excellent. All right, and and Howard, please jump in if I'm if you think I'm missing something. I will. I will. Okay. So. Sorry, that was just an animation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, alrighty. So for, you'll get the slide, the the the, the slide pack, uh, essential content um, concepts. Um, you know, we one of the things that we do to try to structure the unstructured is we create metadata. Um, and for example, you'll have tagging, right? So if you think about your Twitter feed, um, everything has got a hashtag or an at on it. Now that is a, a, an agreement between everybody to say, listen, if we want to have a topic that we're all following, we'll put a particular hashtag on it so that everybody knows what's trending so that you can just look up the hashtag and you'll find all the tweets that have that hashtag in it. Now you're relying on people to put that hashtag in to make it discoverable. Um, and, thing, and, and in SharePoint, for example, Office 365 is exactly the same concept. If you're in SharePoint, you can create tags or, or metadata that you attach to the documents to make them discoverable horizontally, right? So you can see all the documents that have a particular tag attached to them. And it works from being quite structured sort of taxonomies, like where we have our sort of, you know, like our financial documents, right? We know exactly what we mean when we say, you know, there's different types of documents and sub documents, it's very structured. That's a taxonomy, but then you'll have something called a folksonomy, which is where we just dream it up and make it up as we go along, a lot like Twitter. Okay, so we, we try to, to kind of structure and make things searchable. This has all got to do with things being findable. We want to find it again. So we know that folder structures are a little bit difficult sometimes because it can be quite purpose specific or, you know, that team or that division might be structuring things in a very specific way. So to make it more findable for everyone else, we put tags on it to make it more findable. Right. Um, so when, when it comes to understanding Poppy, and this is something where I pull people back when it comes to privacy, is it's really important to stop and think for a moment, what are, what are we actually managing, right, when it comes to privacy? Well, we're, pri we're managing personal information. When we talk about information, like I was just showing you now, like it's broken up into, you know, data, content, documents, records, so forth. Um, King 4 is the, the kind of the best practice for, the, um, for directors, for boards. It's owned by the, direct, the, the Institute of Directors. Um, and it's, it's written by Mervyn King and, and his team. Um, and in King 4 version, uh, King, uh, version 4 report, um, they have split information and technology. So information is all the data, records, and knowledge in electronic or any other format, which form part of the intellectual capital. Which, has, which is going to be transformed or produced by the organization. So when we talk about information technologies, what, they, what, they, what that means is the infrastructure, the devices, the system, and the software that carry the information. And one of the ways that I distinguish it for people is the technology is the plumbing, right? And IT are the plumbers. In fact, your software developers are the plumbers, people who build the infrastructure of things to flow through. 
the information, the data, the records, the knowledge in there, that is the intellectual capital of the organization. And that belongs to the organization. And that you can't expect the plumber to understand what, where exactly you want, like if, if you're building a house, you have to tell the plumber, I want to have two outlets, two tap outlets underneath my, my cabinet uh, countertop in the kitchen because I'm going to put both my dishwasher and my washing machine in. The plumber's not going to come to you and tell you, oh, you should have a dishwasher and a, and a washing machine. That's your job as a business owner, right? Um, so it's very important to start understanding who's responsible for what. And I know Dharma is very good at making sure that we understand ownership, that we have data, data owners, information owners, data stewards. Um, and in my world, that it would also be document owners, um, owners of, of document repositories, and um, people who are accountable for the records management and making sure that things are findable. Okay, so you kind of you get the idea. Okay, technology versus information. The layers of information governance. Um, you know, we have to we have to manage our IT infrastructure. We have to manage our information systems. We have to ma manage our information security. We have to manage our enterprise content, which is the stuff we were just talking about. There's also the data, which is obviously the databases, the data flows, the data warehouses. Um, and we also now need to manage privacy. Um, and it's, it's kind of always lumped as a separate thing, but actually it's something that runs horizontally through all of these, right? So what is information? Just to break it down again, we have enterprise information management or EIM. We have our structured data, which is your master data, databases, and then sort of semi-structured stuff like XML and stuff like that. Um, then you have your unstructured or content management stuff. So you've got your documents, which are all about your intent. They're sort of the things that you, you, you're busy building. It. It's, it's part of your stuff. So uh, your websites, um, things that, you, you, you know, that you're busy working on. But your records are your evidence. Um, and a large part of Poppy is making sure you've got the right level of records management, right? Making sure you know what records you've got. So you have records are evidence of transactions um, of content at a point in time. Now, a, a new type of record that you need to keep track of for privacy is when I consent to something, you're going to give me a notification, right? Caroline, you are consenting to us contacting you about products and services, all right? The message that you give me at that point in time informs me on what it is that I'll be consenting to. Now, websites change. So if you have to actually keep track of what was that message that was bubbled up to me at the point in time when I gave my consent. When I withdraw my consent, you need to know that I, I have withdrawn my consent for the thing that I consented to, right? If I go to the regulator and I complain that you have not respected the fact that I've withdrawn my consent, it's up to you to provide the record, the evidence that I, had, I did consent at this date in time, that I stopped consenting at this date in time, and that you stopped contacting me about products and services after I stopped consenting. Okay, so once I withdrew my consent, you stopped the processing. You need to show the regulator what it was that I agreed to, the content, the piece of content that you showed me on the website, and the message. You need to show the date and time I did the consent and the date and time I withdrew my consent. So that is an audit trail with a record of what the message was that was provided to me. Good, so we're here in unstructured content management. Are we on track so far? Is, there, is, is that all kind of making sense before I move into the copy specific stuff? Any yeah, could, I, could I ask a question? Um, yeah. I, I always, when, when, I, when I talk, my understanding is if I publish something on a website, that is, it, it, it is almost a record when that content goes into the website. Um, so when it becomes public, it, I then have to, I stand that as a record because I've, I've published it on my website. But you've, you seem to have got your documents, uh, which is sort of not really a record. It, it can be at, at a state in time, but you've got websites under document and not under a record. Under records. Because a, a website is changeable and it does change. Um, there's versions each time of the I website. Publish, each time I publish uh, the content on there, so the actual page is a record. Yes, at that point in time, that snapshot yes. of the website at that Correct. point in time. My point is, is that for it to act as a record, 
you've got to be able to produce it at from at that point in time right so sure. if you're able to do that if you have the tools to do that great but then you must know that i'm now dealing with a record of a website at that point in time so sorry what i'm what i'm understanding is that I, I like your example of these were the conditions that i saw on the website at the time i signed the contract um now the company that has the website they have to manage the versions of all of those pages and that page at that point in time when they when they published it it is a record it's a record yeah, yeah. My, my point is is that you, you you need to be aware of the fact that you've got to re, you've got to be able to produce it as a record in a point future point in time so what I'm getting at is, is that if I just go and overwrite the content in my website and I've got no record of what it was before and changed it. Agreed. I, you understand? Well, so now I don't have a record of what the person consented to. I've not changed the concept. But the, wouldn't the, we yeah. list in, in almost in that records evidence that, and this is where I'm, I'm just looking at your examples of a document versus a record. You haven't really mentioned that that web page or the content on the web page is a record. It depends on how it's stored. Do you see, do you see, do you see what I mean? It's, it's how it's stored. So the backup of it is a record, could be a record if you manage it that way. So the backup of it. So if you if I if I put the website down and then I take a snapshot of that and I back it up and no more changes happen to that backup. Yeah. That backup at that date and time, that snapshot is a record. The thing that I've published on my website is not a record. It's something I can go and change that at any time. Yeah, I suppose that's, I mean, that's, but it is a, it's, let's say I took a snapshot of your web page because yeah. at one stage you said I'd get a 30% discount on this or this is what the fees are. That's when I signed and then you, and then you went to change. I said, no, 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 but hold on. I've got a copy of your, of your web page and that's not what it said. And this was the agreement. Mm -hmm. So what I'm getting at is that with Poppy, yeah, sure, as a consumer, you can do that. Um, but with, in Poppy, the, the, the burden of proof is on you as a responsible party. So if I'm the company that owns the, the website, if somebody goes to the regulator and complains that I haven't, I haven't stuck to the consent agreement, yes, I have to prove it's up to the responsible party I understand. to prove to the regulator. You but, but you, I understand, but I, I, I suppose what I'm trying to say in theory, that web page at the time that it was published with the with the, the features on the product that is that is what i understand to be a, a record i mean no the, if, if i took a screenshot of it the screenshot is a record because that can't change okay, okay. the website itself is pretty open to change and does change on a regular basis you might have versions of it which is a good idea um, but it's changeable. It's not a record. A record is a fixed thing. It's like it, it, if I look at it in 10 years' time, it'll look the same. Okay. So you would, I mean, one of the things would maybe then be a, a, the backup of the web page or the website or the, the version yeah. of the website at that point in time. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Now, the, the act of publishing is not enough. Um, okay, so I think we get the idea. Um, enterprise content is one of the layers of um, inter um, ECM, enterprise content management, one of the layers of information governance. Um, so how do we mitigate the risk um, of privacy risk when it comes to these kinds of documents? Some scary facts, 40% um, of breaches are due to accidental sharing. Okay, so this is, this is pure like, nobody in IT has control over this, um, not, not to a great degree anyway. Um, if you allow sharing, people will share. Um, and the number of times that I've seen where, for example, in Google Workspace or on One, OneDrive, um, people will share a document with, or a folder with somebody, maybe an external contractor. Um, and then once that person has left the company or is no longer working for that company or the contract's expired, nobody goes back and removes the sharing of that, of that document. Um, and that's the kind of risk, that's the kind of area that creates risk for, 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 for Poppy. Um, the, the accidental sharing, I mean, the, the ABSA data breach um, was less accidental. It was, it was actually sort of internal risk. It was somebody who got paid to provide a database. So that, that was obviously criminal activity. 
Um, but if you think of the um, Experian data breach, like a couple of years ago, last year or the year before, um, what happened there was is that somebody was just following an operating procedure. Like, so they were just in an apartment, somebody called up and said, hey, I need this data. And that person, as far as that person was concerned, well, they should have access to this data. So they gave them access to the data. So that is not security, right? This is not a security issue. This has got to do with protocols, with practices, with checks and balances and making sure that people are sharing information appropriately. Um, third party data security breaches. If you think about how many times, um, and, and speaking to the sharing, you think about how many times we just attach a document to an email and send it off. As soon as you have, downloaded the data out of your database into a spreadsheet. It's now unstructured information. So your structured information in your database is nice, protected, access controlled, backed up, encrypted, all that good stuff. As soon as we download that into a spreadsheet, now suddenly we've got this unstructured, unmanaged, changeable document that we can now attach to an email and send off. Now think about every time I do that, if I send it to three people, I'm creating, I have a copy of my sent items in my sent folder they each get a copy in their inboxes. So that's now four copies of that spreadsheet. Never mind the copy I probably have on my C drive. Then they respond to that or reply. Now each of them gets another copy of it in their inboxes and somebody has got it in their sent items and I get it in my inbox. You can see how like in the exponential number of copies of this document become enormous. Um, so you really wanna think very carefully about what data can should be allowed to become unstructured. Right, so be careful of like stuff that is structured that becomes unstructured because you lose control, okay? Um, this 5% of companies' folders are properly protected on average. Um, something a lot of people don't know about Windows folder shares, the uh, file shares, is in the folder structure on a file, you know, from file shares, you put up folders and you put the access management on them. If I move a folder to somewhere else, I break the higher, the, I break the access controls. Um, I can change the access control for a specific folder and it'll, it'll cascade down to all the folders underneath that folder. Um, I've seen organizations that have set up Google Workspace, for example, um, and inadvertently shared HR documents with everybody in the organization because they didn't look at the um, access controls and, and the, what was appropriate, like, so just understanding the tools as well, right? Sort of um, something I saw as well, for example, with Microsoft Teams was, um, especially when it first rolled out, it might be different now, but certainly when it first Teams first came out, by default, anybody in the organization could share a team with an external party. Now, I know a lot of people have figured that out now and have locked that down. But at that time, I could share a, my team, I could give access to an external party. So as a test, I gave my, my Gmail account access to this team space, like a you know, sort of couple of channels. I then went into my Gmail account, opened up that team that I was shared with me, and then I shared it with my husband's Gmail account as a test. And that was totally possible. So you, you really have to be careful about sharing, like the, the, the ability to share things like teams. You've got to really understand these technologies and lock them down. Um, yeah. So any questions on, on that sort of, any, any ideas like thoughts on risks or things about, you know, uh, securing stuff through access controls, securing, mm, limiting the behaviors of people as risk mitigation strategies. Um, does anybody have any strategies like that that are particularly useful or anything that you've come across that is, is particularly good? Graham, I know you're there, so can I pick on you? <laughs> he's, he's staying on mute at the moment. Oh, is now, he? Was there, I have two laptops running simultaneously and my mouse was being juggled, but I was on the <laughs> wrong mouse, so oh, nothing was happening. Wow, that's complicated. <laughs> yeah, no, on that term, the, the, the current client I'm at has exactly that issue with, with uh, I won't say it's an issue. They they've got it locked down with teams. Uh, we call them teams within teams, eh? or groups. Channels. Um, Channels. You you cannot share external, which is a very big um, 
frustration because I'm an external contractor. So I can't do anything until such time as I've got an internal mail address set up for me. No. So and it's I a little bit. Of a, it. I mean, once, once you put these controls in place, the the case, the, the the argument to have the functionality doesn't go away, right? So when we when we lock these things down and put in controls, we do need to still cater for the requirement. Yeah, because otherwise yeah. people are going to find magic ways of of, of working around the security. Um, yeah, the, the thing is, you from the, using this example, it. it it's the security and the control is great. Thumbs up. But then it pushes back to the, and I'm just hopping on my scenario, on the productivity of that person. Because the, the business unit hasn't caught up or business unit hasn't done its onboarding stuff quickly enough. So then there's yeah. a 48 hour time lag where you've got somebody on your payroll, but they are just surfing. Or receiving stuff on email attachments because I know that that's that's one of the things, right? It's like, oh, I can't share it with you securely in Teams, so oh, don't worry, I'll just attach it to an email and send it to you because you know. Yeah. And then someone says the best one is, is like someone says to me, oh, I can't receive attachments on my emails at work, so just send it to my personal Gmail account. <laughs> People will find a way. So yeah. Um, yeah, make sure that you are looking at the use cases and understanding how information must flow, right? Because the information must flow. Don't if you're going to put a dam there, make sure your dam was picking up. Like, yeah. <laughs> don't just lock it down. Um, and I think it's important to look at those use cases across the life cycle. Um, don't frustrate people, like in Graham's example. Um, don't create like security shouldn't create lack of productivity if it's thought through correctly. Um, it, it should allow the information life cycle to be fulfilled. Um, yeah. Howard? Uh, no, there's a, there's a question from Ahmed. Yeah? Yeah, uh, thank you. I just wanted to comment when you were mentioning uh, the information life cycle and how you can map, uh, how you can properly map the, the flow of data in order to put your governance and regulations. How, are there any tools that you could use so you can know how the data flows and you can know where you can put your safeguards? I'm very glad you asked that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for five seconds. Just, let me just stop there. Just want to get a clean window open for you. Okay, so I'm just going to. So I, I. I am. I personally am a, a Visio guru. I love Visio. Um, however, most people can't afford it, and it, it very often isn't available to people to work with. Something that I have been doing um, is working on this an online tool like this. So you you'll, you'll find different different types of drawing tools. Anything that can do a simple flowchart diagram will help you to do your data flow diagrams. Ahmed, is that the question you're asking? How do yes. I do the data flow yes. diagrams? Yeah, yeah. yeah. perfect. Yeah, and, and it, it, there's this big mystery around data flow diagrams. Here's the deal. A data flow diagram is nothing more than a workflow. Okay. Okay, it's a workflow. It can be to lesser or, or greater degrees than um, uh, of, of complexity. My preference is from a, um, one of the things that I advocate is stick with your riskiest risks. Okay, in other words, keep it at a 30,000 foot view until you understand your landscape and then draw down. So one of the things that I do is I say to people, draw a diagram. So what are we talking about? I'm talking about my website visitor, mm -hmm. right? Um, or or let, let's talk about recruitment. Recruitment is an interesting, interesting case study. So I have a job, um, uh, not even a job applicant at this point. This is the, the data subject. Um, this person, I have a, a I have a, a container usually in these kinds of drawing tools. So draw IO is pretty nice because when I save this, something I like about this tool, um, it lets me save it to my device. So I don't have to save it um, somewhere crazy, right? Um, so I can save it as a PNG. Um, uh, Dom, um, top. And let's just say I'm going to put that on my desktop for now. And that's not on my machine. It's not out in the cloud somewhere. So that's one of the things I like about this particular tool. 
Um, so now I have a container. So I could say here, this is uh, my organization, right? Um, this is where my data subjects data, they're going to respond to, I don't know, you can use whatever shapes that work for you. Um, Occumate might actually be a really good solution for this as well, by the way. So I have my website. Um, this person enters, a, enters their data. Um, I like to make that a little broader and I like to make that an orange color. To make it really obvious. Uh, orange, yeah. Okay, so the pass is orange. Um, and then what I do is that I'll sort of say, okay, so I have a data subject. They are entering a, a job applicant form on my website, right? And I might actually say which website, yeah? So I'll, 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 I'll be like very specific about which website and which form. Um, and then I'll say, okay, so what does this, this form do? This form then has a temporary database, all right? And I will capture that information in here. Um, so that data then flows into my temporary database. Okay, so you get the idea, right? Um, I then have a workflow tool. Um, let's maybe use this little diagram here. So then I have a, a workflow using, I don't know, what's a popular workflow tool these days? Howard? Salesforce. Uh, Salesforce. Salesforce works. Okay. Um, now, Salesforce, interestingly, is actually hosted in the cloud. So I now have a third party provider. I'm just going to go to Salesforce for them as an organization. Um, they have my data. And this data now flows here, but Salesforce is in the USA somewhere, as far as I remember. And my organization is in South Africa. Uh, I'll go with the, I'll do that. And my data subject is, I don't know where, right? Or they, they could be anywhere. They could be EU, maybe. Maybe I'm targeting people in the EU. Um, and I just sort of start drawing myself a little diagram just to say like, this is what happens. Now, the thing is, is that when I look at this flow, um, that temporary database I can see is, is kind of risky, okay? Because it's now got the CVs, but it's got no good reason to have it for longer than it takes. So once this kick workflow kicks off, there's no reason to keep that, that CV in the, in, in the database anymore. So I make it red and I attach a task to it and I say, go and find out how long the data stays in that database. Right. Then I have this data here. And one of the things that I'll put in here is because Poppy says we must have a contract, right? So um, Salesforce BPA, question mark, question mark, do we have one? Because we're storing CVs in Salesforce. Um, we have CVs in Salesforce, so therefore do we have a retention policy for our Salesforce instance, for the, the, the Salesforce data? Is, is this kind of making sense? This is how I do it. And that this is this helps because what happens is that people then people say to me, oh, the data subject passes their job application form in, into the website and then it goes into Salesforce. Then they come into an interview. But what happens with the interview? Oh, well, then they email it to me. So now we're suddenly dealing with, I don't know, let's use this for email. Now suddenly we've got email in the picture. Mm -hmm. So they've got their, 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 their email, which is great. And then I have my HR department sitting internally over here. And they get the CV in their inbox, right? Somebody gets the CV in their inbox. Um, in Mari's inbox, okay? So now I know that Mari's inbox is potentially problematic. Okay, so I might tidy that up a little bit and do it like that. And say, okay, look. So here we've got a data flow. Um, this is all nice and structured and we can handle it because we've got all sorts of, you know, backups and whatever we're doing, all our IT stuff there. But Mari's inbox, is anybody, how secure is Mari's inbox? 
Oh, no, she shares that inbox because when she goes on leave, she needs other people to be able to access those CDs. So then I'm going to say to you, well, I don't think email is appropriate place for this to land. I think what you need here is for this email to land in Salesforce. So get rid of that. All right. Um, because this is structured. This is not structured. Is that kind of helping? Is that making sense? Caroline, when you cannot... say structure and non-structure again, you mean? So, so structured, if you think of a database, like you know exactly, you, you kept, the, the data is, is, is structured in some way. Like it's either in a table right. format or it's, right. it's, you understand the purpose of every data field and you can very quickly sort, search, filter that data. Right. You know what I mean? Like it's organized, right? Right. Um, and usually there's good security on it. There's access controls, there's backup, there's encryption. There's a lot of good mm -hmm. stuff that happens with that data. Unstructured data is when it starts getting messy. If you think about, for example, if you think about the pain of trying to find the correct version of a document, have you ever lost a document or, or, or made a change in an Excel spreadsheet and then you can't figure out where you kept the ver previous version of that Excel spreadsheet right. and you have to redo the spreadsheet? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. unstructured. So it's not in a neat database. We try to structure it by creating things like metadata. We create tags. We, we, we tr you know, we create versions um, of the document. We try to structure it. And we have tools like SharePoint that will try to help us, um, or, or Google Drive will try to help us with that. But it really boils down to how people want to manage it. And also with structured data, there's usually a structured interface. So there's normally like, you can control what data gets typed in because you'll say, well, if this is a date field, you can't enter anything but dates. Whereas in a document, I can type in anything I want, anywhere I want. You don't know where that date is. If you ask me like, what's, you know, what's this person's date of birth um, in the CV, you're gonna have to read the CV or, or get something to scrape through it or something. It, it also helps to think of it in terms of research. Um, if I send, a, if I walk outside with a clipboard and I go to people and ask them to fill in a piece of paper to give me some research and then understand their world, right? Um, when I get back to my, my research lab, I've now got to translate that into structured data so that I can get statistics. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay, cool. Um, can I throw in tuppence here? Sure. Th th that was almost a deja vu, scary feeling uh, example that you provided. Uh, from our, our previous talk, the example around uh, uh, popping out into a certain client and using the demo wheel, for my own clarification of what the client did and a quick um, up to speed test, if I could call it that, every business unit, I did exactly that exercise that you're doing now to see how they worked, where the data w was going to, and it was frightening how many of the employees utilized the data that, but did not see it in that sort of flow. And once you'd shown it to them in that graphic and you could show a line going external to the company, it's going to the cloud, you could see the person get nervous. They knew that wasn't supposed to happen, but they'd never had it visualized like that in front of them. Therefore, it was just, oh, we do this normally. And now that you're showing it to them in that graphical format, they started to understand why we needed some controls or why we needed other things to happen around yeah. that. And then yeah. what I found handy with that is you start to color those lines according to either the risk level or the data type being used. So there's value add to the business after you've left and that they can see their data flows, the, the happy path, and that's all green. And then you have the bright red or the yellow ones. We say, here's where you've got risks, et cetera, and they can have their own projects later on to clarify or to clean that up. Exactly, yeah. Um, and, I, and I think it's, um, to me, it's super helpful to get it into it. And I don't sweat the details. I don't care what the shapes you use or whatever it is. I just, yeah. as long as the language is what the people who use the data, Remember, I was talking about the difference between the plumber and the and the person yeah. building the house, right? 
like the people that are using the data, it's their language, it's their, their workflow and how they work on it. And the very important thing to notice there is, for example, now we're going to go to interview stage. So now three managers who haven't been part of the process yet are going to need to be in a meeting room with this person to interview them. What do they do? Well, they print the, they, they download the CD onto their C drive and then they print it. Okay, so now you've got the C drive and the paper copy. And now you very quickly start sort of seeing how you need to change the way that you manage your data because you're now suddenly like your, your meeting room. So for example, one of the ways you can manage privacy is say, well, look, our meeting rooms are actually public spaces. Don't leave the CV lying on the table. You know, so you can start spotting risks like that and understanding how this gets messy. Um, and, and just on paper, um, the, the whole issue of paper management, you know, um, what, one of the suppliers that you should have a contract with in your office is the people who empty your dustbins. Because if they come in and they're cleaning out your dustbins and they find sensitive data, papers in there, do they know what to do with that? Do they have, do you have a, some kind of secure data collection service? And do they know that they've got to take the paper off the printer or out of the bin and put it into that secure paper box? Um, rather than just tipping it into the municipal paper um, in the municipal bank. So those those data flow diagrams help you to start identifying those risks. Maybe if I can if I can comment there, Carolyn, I, I like one of the terms you or one of the words you used up front was to keep focusing on the riskiest risks. Um, mm -hmm. And Ahmed, Ahmed, what what is important is it's a that that's where you start and, and it's very critical but then as you start to from a data governance point of view ensure that you have your data lineage and your data flow and your data catalogs you you then need to become more uh how does one say more th that discovery and that automation you need you need stronger tools i yes. think carolina has got a great way of, of defining it up front and getting the focus but the very first time that you, you put it down, you must know that within a day or a week that thing's gone out of date. But it's helpful for you to get people's visualization going and then you get more, you get more complicated. And interestingly, I shared an a, a image on, on the chat where people are looking for a set of tools that manage this type of lineage and there aren't a lot of tools that manage everything from your business process all the way through. So it's not an easy task at the moment to keep going. And that's why I like focusing on your riskiest risks and and then trying to almost get the business to manage that and, and to keep to keep working on it. Exactly, yeah. And just on this the subject of tools, just to close out because we, we are at the time. Um, one of the things that the discipline of enterprise content management brings to the table is to use appropriate tools, right? So, for example, a lot of people use SharePoint document libraries for managing records. Yeah. And you, you all hit, hit up against issues. They have got record libraries. The um, Microsoft uh, Compliance Center has got records management policies that you can implement to manage things like disposition and like when are we going to delete it? Like, how long must we keep this record? What's our file plan, right? And what I want to say about that is, if you're going to put your file plan into SharePoint records to manage records, make sure it matches the file plan you gave to Metro File or Document Warehouse <laughs> for the yeah. paper versions, right? Like, this is not like different things. This is still records management. Your records management must be the same for the paper and for the and for the electronic stuff. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You know, um, collaboration versus email ping pong, like. Please, if people are sending emails backwards and forwards, you have got an issue. You have got to start talking about collaboration tools, um, very like Teams, for example, or using online documents. And sometimes it's just a case of people feeling confident about it or knowing that it's secure and knowing that it's not going to be accidentally shared with the company. Um, but definitely try to get away from email ping pong. You need you need collaboration tools, all right? Uh, sharing large files, um, companies that have architecture diagrams. Um, marketing who who have very large files very often that need to be shared with external parties make a plan. P people like Metrofile have got ways of doing things like that. Um, there are there are a number of ways of dealing with large files, and especially for marketing. Marketing have a very specific content management requirements, and there are very specific asset management tools for that. Okay, so 
don't leave them with SharePoint, for example. Let investigate what their world needs and, and help them. Um, yeah, sharing rather than putting attachments, as I explained a little bit earlier. You, you probably need case management or workflow. For example, that CV coming into Mari's inbox, that should go through a workflow and land at SharePoint. The same way that your, your, your website goes into a workflow and lands at SharePoint, right? In our example, you need case management. Um, don't, if, if you have to trawl through emails, if you have to remember to check your inbox to make something happen, there's a problem. You, you need either a case management tool or a workflow tool. A classic, classic example there is the way you interact with help desk. If you send them an incident ticket and log and you send it to the help desk tool, it will get a ticket number and it will become structured. If you, or semi-structured at least, if you just email your favorite person in IT, you're entering unstructured world and their world becomes almost unimaginably complex. Um, I always say to people, if you're going to use email instead of case management, add 30% to your turnaround time because that's how much efficiency you're probably going to lose, maybe up to 60%. Um, so if you're building email into your systems, just know you, you, your, your efficiency is going down. Look at things like automation and machine learning, especially for things that are high volume, low complexity. If I've got invoices coming in from external like of my suppliers and they're coming for flowing through three or four or five managers and those managers are then telling my client debtors clock or credit clock whatever they have to get it into accounts to do invoice payable that is a high volume low complexity process that could probably use a degree of automation or even machine learning to read those invoices and understand how to get them into into your directly into your finance system bypass all the email boxes please um, discovery tools, things like Verona's, things like Grand Labs. Um, these are tools that will go and sniff through those file shares and your SharePoint folder and your Outlooks and your OneDrives to go and see what data is in there. They will use pattern matching to find the sensitive documents, to find the personal information, to find the account numbers which carry the 10 million Rand fine. You want to make sure that you're finding that information and then bringing that under control so that you're able to manage your risk as risk, right? So you're looking for special personal information, information about children, dates of birth, gender, health information, anything like that, you want to make sure that you're managing it. Discovery tools are a good idea. Um, not easy to use, but a good idea. And I know that Microsoft Compliance Center, I think, has a couple of tools like that as well. Um, and then when it comes to your data breaches and managing incidents, make sure you've got tools to help you to triage. Um, so very often those discovery tools can help you with the triage as well, or at least the reports they've produced. Um, but have understand e-discovery, understand how to make the keep evidence, like your forensics. Um, and build that into your incident management process, your data breach management, your business continuity management. Make sure that you've got the right tools to handle that stuff so that you're not dealing with an unstructured world at a time when you're under pressure and have very serious time constraints. So that is the advice from Caroline. Um, any questions on that? Because I think we are pretty much out of time. So um, happy to leave it there, happy to move on. Um, I do have one or two other slides, but I think this kind of covers the gist of what I wanted to get across today. So any other questions or anything specific you want me to delve into or do you need to head off? I think that's great. Uh, I think it's important that we that people are just aware of of how that uh, structured data becomes unstructured and, and it disappears all over the place, mm -hmm. and and how we need to just pay attention to the technology to help us stop that from happening. Um, and and uh, it reminds me of one company I'm working for at the moment, where initially we were even though we had the same email address like Graham was talking about, they, they took initially it took two weeks to onboard a person. So the contractor was sitting there for two weeks doing nothing. Um, and then what they had, what they did was they actually forced us to stop using Outlook on our machines and we could only use it on a remote desktop. We weren't allowed to use Outlook on your machine because of all that structured data that just drifts into into Outlook and now all of a sudden that PST on your on your on your machine has got their data. 
Yeah. Then, yeah. then we weren't allowed to use Outlook and, and connect Outlook to the to the email server. Yeah, or your, or your phone. I mean, yeah. even worse. Yeah. <laughs> Having Outlook on your phone um, without any security on it. Um, yeah, once once something is local, stored locally, um, it's it's obviously you know theft, loss. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And unintended access. Yeah. Any other questions or, or thoughts or any comments from anybody? Um, Ahmed, I have got a little diagram to show you if you've got time. Um, just on that data flow question again. Um, should I jump into that or do you want to stick with the ECM slide? Or do you want to close out? No, let's let's have a quick look. Um, okay. Um, oh, this was just a quick playbook for file shares. Um, I just wanted to say, don't sweat the details. Don't go down into every single document and worry about what's in every single document. If HR says this is their directory, everything in there is is confidential, right? So assume it's got personal information in it. Um, and delete without mercy, hey? Anything that's older than 10 years, there's, there's very few legislations that will tell you to keep something for longer than 10 years. So as soon as you see it's 10 years old, get the owner to agree to delete it, um, including your boxes of venture policy. Um, and yeah, assign a risk rating, like, you know, what penalties are, could be attached to this and how newsworthy is this? Um, so yeah, make sure that if it has a data breach, that you're in control, that you know what that folder or directory is worth in terms of a data breach. I once found an organization that had kept all their religious congratulations, happy Easter, happy Eid cards, um, digital cards on the HR folder. And they, for a company that had only had like 300 employees in its lifetime, they had something like 500,000 wow. like, <laughs> like cards going back 10 years. I was like, oh my goodness. So <laughs> yeah, just be away. Um, so we spoke about the riskiest risks, and um, we've looked through that before, but basically just offenses and penalties, just be aware of what data is actually sensitive, right? Uh, bank account details is a big one. Um, and this is the thing for Ahmed. So this is a, a, a sort of almost like a very sort of smarty box diagram of a software integration, but it, it, it applies just as easily to document flows or um, to systems. So what I've done is that I, I sort of have a what risk factor and jurisdiction are we dealing with? Who's the controller or the responsible party? Because remember internationally, like if, 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 who's actually responsible for the data subject? Um, who's acting as a processor? <coughs> um, they, they, they're white with red around them. Um, the software is a service responsibility. So it's worth pulling that up because things like SharePoint, I mean, yeah, SharePoint, Office 365, Salesforce. And then boundary of authority. Now, authorization boundaries is, is a concept. You, you can look it up in this. Um, I've dumbed it down nicely just to kind of keep, make it accessible to the rest of us. Um, and what I've done is I've just used this concept of like red and, red and yellow and green flags to indicate risky areas. I've indicated cross-border flows by inserting flags and also uncertainty, you know. If I am the service provider, if I'm providing the software, I don't know where my customer's customer is. So I don't know where their data subjects are. Um, so that's that's all um, kind of to be managed. And then I am responsible for any third party plugins or any suppliers or third parties that I bring in. So if my software has got plugins or um, API calls into something else, um, it, you, you, you need to know that that is your responsibility. Um, credentials to get into my software, that's my responsibility. Um, so what happens is, is that once I've mapped it, I sort of say, okay, look, everything that is red, all the red arrows are the responsibility of the processor. All of the yellow arrows are the responsibility of the controller. So if I have data flowing out of my software into somewhere else, that's not my problem. The stuff coming in, that's my problem. I must make sure that that's encrypted and that that is actually going over a secure channel. And then I put little blocks on, um, I'll do red blocks with SPI in it. If it's special personal information, I, I group children and SPI together um, just to keep it simple. 
Um, and then I sort of just, just a, yeah, just to, just to get like the authorization, just to get a feeling for who's accountable for what, right? Like it gets complicated, so it's worth making it a little bit um, safer. Um, oh, sorry, a little bit um, simpler. And then basically just whack them all there. Like look for those, just look for those orange dots and see if you can reduce them. You know, if your if your software developers have got test data, the client is giving your software developers personal information in the test data. For goodness sake, stop that. Right, because now, now you've got data coming in that you're responsible for, and you've got personal information sitting on the development machines, which are usually not very well managed. So sure. yeah, and very often with third parties. So um, yeah, play whack-a-mole, get rid of those orange spots. That's one of the ways I like to manage privacy risk. And Thank I suppose, you, that's very helpful. Ahmed, also the, the thing you can do there is using the PET, which is your privacy enabling technologies, for example, on the client test data, if you can obfuscate or, or you know, just actually uh, transfer oh the data, you know, then then that PI, that PI goes away. So you, for each of those risks, you must look at what technology you can use to, uh, because a lot of times that requirement is there, there's some reason for it, you just got to, you got to get it out, get get the right protection applied. Right, right. Yeah. Well, thank you so okay. much. Yeah, does that does that remove some of the mystery? I know that these data flow diagrams sort of. I know I felt like they were terribly complex and mysterious. Or yeah, I think when you get to architecture and and metadata, then they become very very complicated. And, and you can roll it up and down, but this is always a great way to interact and, and understand your business and get them to recognize that there's challenges and, and at some stage they, they got to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. Also, Caroline, you inadvertently said something which is a very powerful thing when you're first starting that little data flow diagram is that don't, don't approach business with this diagramming methodology and special symbols yeah. because you, you immediately leave them out. Of, they, they, they just switch off. It's but if, like you were saying, it, we just take this gubbinsy thing and this means a database and we put this here and we just, you randomly pick symbols while they're watching so they don't think you're actually leading them on a methodology or an approach and yeah. say, well, do you think this is how it works? And they, in their minds, they've drawn up this flow without realizing they've been led into process engineering 101 um, <laughs> and you, you haven't scared them off by running at them with this complicated A4 with a hundred little lines joining each other with oh, special yeah. symbols, uh, like a, a wiring diagram of a household that scares them. But if you just draw it uh, almost like a, uh, what would you call it, the, the cigarette box type diagram, uh, just on the back of a box, just a simple square here and a line to that and a circle, which is whatever, then they understand it and they come on board. Yeah, and everyone knows red is risky. Um, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's for companies, <laughs> red, that drives me mad. <laughs> yeah, um, you know we don't have to talk about cross cross border transfers or trans border transfer. You know trans border flows. Um, we can just put like you know this is the UK, this is South Africa, this is the USA. We're all about that. Yeah. Yes. And it's simple. It, it, they, they can pick it up easily enough and they, they don't feel threatened. I think that's the, the thing. They, they know this in the back of their minds. They've just, for the most part, never had it drawn. And they don't want to be shown up as being ignorant to how it's drawn. But if you keep it simple like this, then they, they jump on board. Yeah, and it's amazing. You know, if you get a group of people together to talk about their process, like, like recruitment. Um, you know, once you start talking about, yeah, but also, but then you must remember that if, like, if this happens, then we need to like, you know, for example, we need to do background checks. So now what we're going to do is we're going to put the stuff there and then so-and-so is going to put it on their computer. And then, um, yeah, it, it's, it all becomes quite interesting once I break that out for them. And then I say, okay, now you've got three different third parties here. Have you got a contract with every single one of them? Yeah. And I think that's a, a really great way to lift up the awareness and, and knowledge of what this, what this thing is. Well, what this is all about when you do these things with them. Yeah, exactly. It's 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 better to draw it with the person and show them because they can become quite complicated. But if it's something they've built and then they realize like, OK, wait, just look at the red stuff. Just focus on that. Yeah, um, that's, that really helps. Yeah. 
So yeah, so that's um, unstructured data, nice unstructured methodology, so. <laughs> But the people approach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Caroline, thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Anybody? Celeste, is there anything more you'd like to know? Nothing else from my side, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for an informative session once again. Thanks. Thank oh, you're you. very welcome. I'm glad it was informative. <laughs> it's good. Great. Guys, thanks everybody. I'm going to switch off the recording and everyone have a fantastic day and, and those that are breaking their fasts and that enjoy. Yeah,